open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. The pod bay doors are open. Thank you very much for joining us once again. I'm your host, Doug Heller, film critic and film historian for TalkMovieToMe.com. Here, as always, with the legendary film critic for armchaircinema.com, armchairoscars.com, and overthinkingoscars.wordpress.com, Jerry Dean Roberts. How you doing? Will you kindly refresh my unclean soul? <laughs> now finally. I'll polish your store, sword. Yes, finally. Finally, finally, finally. finally. Uh, this has been... Um, we've had to put this one off a little bit because um, stuff came up. January stuff, um, work. <laughs> I got Bell's palsy. Yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah, but I finally got my face back. Um, but we had to put this one on hold because it is five hours. Yes. Um, this is a trilogy. This is the Samurai trilogy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Samurai One, Musashi Miyamoto, Samurai Two, Duel at Ichijoji Temple, and. Uh, Samurai 3, Duel at Gunryu Island, mm -hmm. all three written and directed by Hiroshi Inagaki, mm -hmm. who uh, had also done... Well, it's based on a series of seven books. Uh, right, right, right. And uh, the the director was, was fairly well known um, mm -hmm. He did, uh, I'm trying to see what else he did. Anyway, uh, it's, it's about the, uh, the early, uh, career life of the warrior, the most famous samurai ever known, uh, Musashi Miyamoto, uh, who, uh, lived in the very, very, very early 17th century. 1600 or something like that. 1600. 1600. Okay. Uh, he was the the first battle like it opens and it says 1600. So like that's the the first date you get. And... Okay, I was a little um confused on the timelines because the movie looks and plays out like it takes place a lot earlier. But later in the film, you just briefly see some people with rifles. Mm -hmm. um, and I know gunpowder existed at this point, oh, but yeah. it's very, very sparse. You don't see it. Um, you don't. You don't see it except in that one scene. Not so, really. Um, but they were. Uh, they did have them. Yes. Um, yes. Muskets and things. Because I mean, they even they had they had rifles in Europe in yeah you know, when they by the time uh, America was colonized. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, I mean Napoleon, you know the. Well, he was um, in the eighteen. Was that? The War of, the war of eighteen twelve was uh, was Napoleon. Okay. Um. The, but that was after that was after America was colonized. Well, after it was eighteen hundred, we, 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 we Revolutionary we, War was fought with muskets. Yes, you know, muskets yep. and squirrel guns and things yep. like that. And that was the eighteenth century. But yeah, even even stuff going back into you know the the fifteenth century, the the fourteen hundreds, mm -hmm. uh, Europe had guns. Um, at least armies did. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it it they were they were around, but Japan wasn't really into forward thinking at the time, um, because this this is during uh, the Edo period. It's 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 in the it's in the waning years of the Edo period. It's in the last two hundred years of it. <laughs> this character um when we first meet him is about as far from how we leave him five hours later as you possibly could be mm -hmm. 
Um, when you meet him, he's a young man. He has no direction in life. Right. Um, he's very immature. Mm hmm And you don't actually think that he's going to become this legendary man of the sword. You don't think that that's... Um, you think he's, he's going to be kind of a goof. He's going to spend his waning years... Um, perhaps either as a gentle farmer or as a, as a, as a drunk or something. Right. Um, he does not, his, his presentation at the very beginning does not suggest what he will become. Uh, no. That is a very, um, that's a very important thing, you know, and one of the reasons that I always say, it's very unwise to cast stones when it comes to young people mm -hmm. because you don't know what the journey of their life is going to carry them to. Right, right. Just because someone's a low, you know, is is undisciplined and doesn't um, seem to have a direction early in life doesn't mean that they won't pick one up along the way. Like like all those Italian movies that have the, the parents screaming at the kids, you're no account, kids. You're not going to grow up to be anything. It's like, yeah, not with that attitude. Not with that attitude. <laughs> not with that kind of encouragement. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and it, it's... Um, uh, it's an important outlook. Mm -hmm. um, because he does... They go. They go into. They they go into the army. They now go this into is battle. this is Toshiro Mifune. Yes. As uh, the legendary Toshiro Mifune. Oh, oh. as uh, he he starts out. His name is Takezo. 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 Yeah. And um, that's his that's his birth name. And he's mm -hmm. running around with a guy uh, named Matahachi, who is engaged to Otsu. Whose nickname is Don't Give a Shit. <laughs> this guy is, I mean, you want to talk about any way the wind blows. I mean, yeah. it's going if to he war, had a philosophy. he's coming with you. If it's hiding away from war, he's coming with you. <laughs> if he had a philosophy, he'd be a flower child. I mean, right. honestly, yeah. Yeah. he just, no direction, no. any way the wind blows. And uh, that... That causes him a lot of turmoil. Yeah, a lot of stress and turmoil. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he winds up just being an empty shell of a man by the end. Yeah. Of, uh, he's the counterpoint. Right. He is, he's, he's what Tekazo could have been. Yes, yes. If he had stayed in his uh, brash, wild ways. He was, he was, he was kind of a, he was a maniac. Mm -hmm. Um just indiscriminate with who he killed and who he who he fought and just uh like a rabid dog but then that that one priest uh sees in him the capability the capacity of a great samurai mm -hmm. and he i sees love something that no one else can see i love the end of of the first one um also bear in mind for Mifune, this was his, let's see, he, Toshiro Mifune was in two of the three most expensive Japanese movies ever made up to that point. Um, and, uh, and all three of them were in 1954 and one of them mm -hmm. was the seven samurai. Uh, yeah. the other one was this one and the one that he wasn't in, uh, was Gojira. Yeah. Um, all three of which were produced by Toho, mm -hmm. and if I'm starting to wonder what in Japan at this point wasn't produced in Toho, because <laughs> <laughs> I think almost there every were, movie that we've picked, every were, Japanese movie that you picked, has been <laughs> has been out of there Toho. Were, there, were, there were two others. There were there were two other studios. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think even the Godzilla that. movies came out of Toho. Oh yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah. So did Zatuichi. Um, yeah. It was the biggest one, very, very clearly. Um, but uh, this was a huge gamble, because with this, Seven Samurai, and Mifune was on his way up, but mm 
but it was after this and Seven Samurai that he was regarded as the peerless actor that he ultimately was. Right. Um, and uh, a few other Kurosawa people uh, show up. Um, the uh, the leader of the Seven. Um, and the, 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 the lead in Akiru, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he, he plays one of the, one of Musashi's friends in one of the later, uh, episodes and uh, I think the second, late in the second one and into the third one. Um, but basically this trilogy tells a story of, um, first it tells Takazo's change. Right. Um, the priest basically imprisons him in a in an attic full, oh, I love that. full yeah. of books. He says, in, in here you will find everything you need to become the samurai you desire to be. And For there's, years. Yeah, there's hundreds of books for like two or three years. He's in there reading, studying, learning forms, mm-hmm. and... When he comes out, he's a completely different man. So <laughs> so different that that he's renamed Musashi. And Miyamoto is the village that he came from, so they named him Musashi Miyamoto. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a story of him, and eventually, Otsu, who was engaged to Matahachi, until Matahachi married Akami's mother. I'll get there. Uh, and, and so Otsu was like, yeah, screw you, and fell for Takazo. Uh, it's... I never sensed... Um, how do I say this nicely? There's a union between him and Otsu that I found somewhat obligatory. It's like there's a journey here, mm. but there has to be a romance. Well, so I was I was thinking to myself. Bear in mind that it was even though it was Japan, it was still the fifties. But yeah, well <laughs> the thing is, their union is so loose to the rest of the story that I kept thinking it's not really a romance. She's not. She's. Her attachment to him seemed to be a person that she is she cares very much about. Not necessarily a person that she's passionate about. You're my friend, you're my you know I, I, I sense I'm i I'm worried about you. I think their their affection for each other was genuine. It's an affection um, without necessarily being without necessarily feeling like a romance. I don't know. Well, yeah, because it's it doesn't take any traditional romantic right. turns because uh, Musashi's primary goal is to be a great samurai. He's not. He's like a Jedi. He can't exactly, have exactly that kind of attachment. That, that's exactly what it is, and uh, but she keeps following along, and he does love her, but he made a vow. And he's going to stick to it. He knows the barriers are there. It, right. And so there's there's that story. There's him training, um, which comes to include... Uh, 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 what's the kid's name? Um, oh, um... Is it Jotiro? Yeah, jo- Jotaro. 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 Uh, and the, uh, the horse uh, trader. Mm-hmm. Um... But there's a there's a third story that comes out in the second one um, that carries over into the third one, uh, and it's this my favorite character. respectful rivalry between Musashi and Saijiro Yosho- Yoshioko, mm-hmm. and uh, Saijiro is as competent a swordsman as Musashi. They are... But also a little arrogant. Oh, a little? But also, he's arrogant. He's, um, he's, he's, my, he's my favorite character. I love this guy. He's an excellent character because he's arrogant, but he has a legitimate reason to be. 
Right. He is very good. He's also very pretty. Yes. Um, he's wearing a lot of makeup. Yeah. <laughs> and he adorns himself in that way. Mm -hmm. um, that arrogance plays to his nature. Mm -hmm. um, when you see him on screen... Now, I'll, I'll say this. And I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can. When you watch a movie like this, from the perspective of an American who does not indulge in too many Japanese films. Mm -hmm. It's hard sometimes to tell one actor from another. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful. It's just... Um, when you don't know who the actors are, because I know who Toshiro Mifune is. Sure. And a lot of the actors, I had a little trouble telling one from the other unless they come off a little more outward like the kid jitaro J jitaro I, mm -hmm. I know who he is um but and you probably the priest because he doesn't look like anybody else right he stands right. out there's a lot of characters in these oh yeah so i had a hard time fitting who this person was with the with their name. It's like, okay, who is this person? Okay, this is Akemi, this is Otsu, this is mm -hmm. uh, Jitaro, this is this person. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know, I watch a lot of these, obviously, so it's not really a concern. You see actors come up again and again. Oh, yeah. It's not like when I watch American films and... Um, when you watch a lot of American films, you do see the same actors come oh, yeah. up over and over again. Oh, yeah. It's, when you don't... The same thing happens in... in um, it happens to me, at least in Italian, Scandinavian, uh, French cinema. You know, I, I, I do know more of those actors because I flock to those movies, especially right. the older ones. Um But yeah, I can. I guess I can understand. Um, so it really does take a lot of. You you really do have to pay attention. Well, you did. You did a lot of uh, really deep prep work for this. Uh, I tried. Um, <laughs> I tried. I'll I'll tell you um, what happened to me with this. I I had seen it. I bought it. Uh, the Criterion DVDs ages ago and watched them ages ago um they have since been remastered and re-released by criterion on dvd and blu-ray which i do not have i put in yeah. the disc first time since i'd bought it 15 years ago maybe mm -hmm. and <laughs> the quality looked like it was transferred from a vhs tape yeah it's an old movie, and it looks bear, like an old movie. Bear in mind, though, that this is a 1998 to 2004 Criterion DVD. So there, this yeah. was before 4K restoration existed. This is, <laughs> so I ended up watching them on the Criterion channel. And I got through it once, and I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. And then you and I started talking about it, and I'm like, looking back and forth, and I'm like, and then I watch it again. <laughs> it's a very easily rewatchable series. Um, it is five hours. Uh, <laughs> I will say that. Um, Shorter than a Godfather. But I will say this, and this comes up a lot. In any film, whether it's The Seventh Samurai... Ron, Arakiri, the Samurai Trilogy. Where I'm always fascinated is the template of the, um, the, the social rules that are observed. Mm -hmm. And by that, and it's very prevalent here, mm -hmm. but by that I mean um, within this culture, follow me on this mm -hmm. within this culture 
there's a strict order oh. of social discipline. Oh, yes. By that, I mean, for example, um, when this is kind of epic, the scene at the very beginning of the second part, mm -hmm. when he fights this guy with a chain. Oh, God, that one's... Oof. It's so epic. It is. But immediately following that match to which to which he emerges victorious, he meets an old man mm. who chastises him mm -hmm. because he has learned a lot of stuff. He's learned a lot. He's been in that attic for three years. He's learned every inch of the sword. He's learned every motion of the sword. He has lived by the sword. Mm -hmm. But the old man tells him, "You still have a long way to go." Right. You're too. Because you're too strong. You're too strong. Mm -hmm. You have a long way to go. The problem is you have no compassion. You have no compassion. I loved that. Um, where I was going with this is the code that they live by. Because he comes across this sword, this this uh, man that he wants to re um, repair his sword, and the man says, "I can't." And then he leaves, and he comes back, and the man says, "Well, I can't because I'm not qualified. I'm not to good be, enough to do. I'm not good this enough sword. to do this." Yeah. What I'm so interested in is this weird and through my eyes sort of ridiculous environment social environment of codes honor dishonor family honor that if you dishonor me in any way which given the template, sometimes tends to be the least little thing. Mm -hmm. We have to battle to the death, and one of us has to end up dead. Mm -hmm. You are within this family, and you have done something. You have committed the slightest infraction. Therefore, our doors are closed to you. Our family name has been soiled by being attached to you. Mm -hmm. So you have to go and do this, or you have to kill yourself. Yeah. This very strange social code, and it's interesting. Now, I'm going to take a side road here, if you don't mind. Just this morning, I was watching a, um, I was reading something on Edward Smith. Who was the captain? Who was on? Was the captain of the Titanic? Hmm. And it was his last voyage before retirement, and he died. Hmm. By British naval rules of the time, the captain had to go down with the ship mm -hmm. because, as I've heard other stories. That if you don't, that's your ass. Yeah. Because if you come back home, you will lose your home, your job, your military standing, everything you own. Right. It's not honor. It's a uh, pension. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and honor. Yeah. Too, because your name is now a pile of shit, and so is your entire family name. And I found this in so many cultures. Mm -hmm. This strange code of honor, code of ethics, that if you don't, you will bring shame on your family name for generations to come. Right. If you don't do something so ridiculous as let yourself die. Yeah. Or make yourself die. Or put a, or in in the case of Harakiri... Put a stump, a a, a bamboo sword into oh, no, your no, own no, no. stomach. It's supposed to be a real sword. 
The hot, no, in that movie, in, in that the, movie, it was a, it was a bamboo that's sword. That's because he had to sell his blade, and all he had right. was bamboo, and they kind of did that. That's a whole thing that would go only specifically with that movie. Under okay. every other circumstance, they used a real knife and disemboweled themselves, and then got their head right. cut off by a second. But you know what I'm saying? Yes. This bullshit idea that you've done something and your only penance is your life mm -hmm. is insane. Yeah. It exists. It has existed in my culture. Mm -hmm. I come from the American South. Remember, remember, um, remember 150 years ago, you know, the old, um, uh, southern gentlemen yeah. you know you have offended my honor sir. oh yeah the, du know? the duels in the south were ridiculous yeah it's, it, it came from a french tradition mm -hmm. but the duels of the south that the only way that i can get satisfaction is by murdering you right or you, you know? murder me and i then i won't care about it either way. <laughs> right <laughs> somebody has to end up did right. i have never understood this idea i uh, and if you don't live a certain way if you don't think a certain way mm -hmm. if you don't talk a certain way if you don't come from the right family you are not worthy of living mm -hmm. this is a a point that we are only now in the 21st century beginning to try to topple <laughs> yeah and are finally making any kind of headway and it is very slow headway and it's very slow headway thousands of years of human history and we still haven't gotten rid of this shit you see what i'm saying yeah. am i making sense yeah, yeah 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 i mean it comes to this as his journey mm-hmm you walked into town, you walked into town in the wrong part of the day. You talked to the wrong person. You stepped on my crops. You looked at my horse wrong. We have to meet at we have to meet at dawn at dusk and kill each other. And the, the it's uh, insane. The other side of that then is uh, Musashi kind of becomes Johnny Ringo. Right. Right. Every kid wants to test his metal, literally test his metal mm -hmm. against a man who has never lost a a match in. Was it at the? Because you want to be that the, person at the beginning of the third one when he embarrasses that guy with the spear. Mm -hmm. Um, the guy says he, you know, he's won, he's and undefeated. Grabs hold of it, and the guy's trying to twist yeah, it away. He's from like, him. He, it's it's. You're no match for him. He's unbeaten in 60 matches. Mm -hmm. He has killed 60 people just in dual combat. That's mm -hmm. not counting the wars and the multiple times that he's just mm -hmm. had to fight for his life. <laughs> that is a staggering number. Mm -hmm. And... But I can't get away from the code that he is forced to live under which is insane because it's like it's, it almost felt to me like that yes they're trying to build him up yes they want him to be this legendary warrior but it just always seemed like a journey he's never going to finish well that's um, the point um he... The, sec the the best sim the best symbolism for his entire life is at the end of the second movie when he is walking off toward the sunset mm -hmm. and you see the long road ahead of him mm -hmm. living by a code that from my point of view is kind of insane mm -hmm. because you'll never really get where you're where you're trying to get to well um that's why when he ultimately uh, defeats um, Saijuo. Sai, Sai, Sai mm -hmm. um, it doesn't say this in the movie, but if you know anything about Musashi's life, 
basically after the duel at Gunrayu Island, he retired to teach and write. That's when he wrote the Book of the Five Rings and mm -hmm. all of those legendary uh, books on the Bushido Code and all yeah. of that. Uh, he he ba he retired. He's like, yeah, I'm not doing this dueling crap anymore. I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm done. I'm just a teacher, and uh, it was because. First of all, he had killed the only person that he understood was an actual uh, challenge to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he swore off the sword to Otsu. Mm -hmm. And he fights that duel after swearing off the sword without breaking his promise, which I right. absolutely adore. Mm -hmm. Um the 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 third one winds up you see him complete the transition into a responsible man mm -hmm. yeah. um because the third one the 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 first one was the journey the beginning it it was his origin stories you know at the end of it he he put on his costume and he was musashi miyamoto and, and the second one was kind of his training and his his uh baptism by fire if you will um and coming all the way down to the the duel at ichijoji temple which ended up being a uh an ambush of 80 samurai of yeah. which I'm pretty sure he cut through about sixty by uh, by the end. Of it. <laughs> like the choreography in that is beautiful oh. because um, I love it when he moves forward and twenty of them move backwards. Yeah. Um, which you know it's fantasy because he never would have won that battle. <laughs> he's not going to win. He, he, I, I don't care how good he is. Sixty men, he's not winning that battle. Um. <laughs> It, it makes for great fiction yeah but um and it's a and and you can tell that uh this this series and the 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 duel at ichijoji temple specifically um that that mass battle was a key influence on um the house of blue leaves segment in uh kill bill at least I yeah. could see it. Um, and, uh, there's a there's a few uh, things that you can see, and the the score to this, if if this score wasn't a direct influence on Ennio Morricone, I don't know what yeah. is. There's, there's there are flashes of this theme in the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly theme. Mm -hmm. That bum bum yeah bum bum. Bum, bum. Yeah, you can hear a lot of influences. Oh in yeah, yeah, and um, so by the time we get to the third one, he's ready to just kind of be a person. You kind of know where the third one is going, story wise, um, because this is it's the third one, so it's the wrap up. Um, that's why the second one was so great mm -hmm. because. You really don't know where it's going. The second one's probably the best one. The second one, I think the second one is the best one. Um, but again, I, I, I'm I, sorry, I didn't mean to take such a long trip earlier, but <laughs> just the idea, I, I'm so interested in this idea of he takes this road, and what is it Qui-Gon says? Um, you can become a Jedi, but it's a difficult life. Mm -hmm. and Je Jedi and Samurai are almost parallel to each other oh, yeah. in, a, in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, in the sense that you will spend your life having to defend yourself mm -hmm. problem is you have to be at heart a man of peace because you don't want to go out because you know you don't want to go out picking fights right um Having power and abusing power are different, very, very different things. Right, right. And Musashi has the power. It's just he has to learn how to control that. 
And there are times, especially with that guy with the pole, that guy with the pole that he humiliates in the third one. Yeah. There's a look in his eyes like, I really don't want to do he this. He really did not. I, you know, I've, I've done this about he's, 60 times before. Yeah. I don't want to do this he's, again. He's like, I, I, I apologize for the kid. Yeah. No, I want to fight you. No, I don't want to fight. No, you don't want to fight me. Yeah, yeah you don't. You don't. You don't want to do this, sir. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it winds up that the master is that old guy that told him he was too powerful at the beginning of the yeah. second one. Um, right. And he actually says, "You know, I marvel at your change. Mm-hmm. He's a completely different person by this one. He basically he's he's training Jotaro." And he winds up with another student, um, which is a, a a tough guy that really wanted to get up in Musashi's business until mm-hmm. Musashi started catching flies with chopsticks. And they're like, uh, uh everybody he's, runs downstairs. They're like, he's terrific. Oh, my God. And he immediately picking, becomes his picking, uh, uh, picking flies out of the pasta. Whatever that was. Out of the noodles, the, uh, yeah. The yeah. noodles, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, uh... I love the old man. The old man is so great because he looks like... He looks like the the Zen master in every kung fu movie you've ever seen. Yeah. And he he's sort of a combination of Obi-Wan and Yoda in that he respects the guy for training. He He's, he's happy that he's training, but at the same time, he has no faith in him. Right. He has no faith in his abilities because, you know, I'm dealing with a ball of anger right here. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm dealing with a ball of adolescent anger <laughs> that has to be home, has to be shaped and honed down. Right. To be, um, to be a great uh, samurai warrior, mm-hmm. to be to be a great samurai. But he's got a long way to go, and he's impressed when he sees him again at how, like you say, he's impressed with how far he's come. Right. Um, he doesn't want to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to know how to fight, but don't be quick to the fight. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, you lead this lead. Be the leader of the sword, but don't let the sword do the leading. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And. Uh... You know, he he has just come such a long way that he eventually takes uh, Jotaro and, was it Kuma? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Kuma Goro, Kuma. Uh, and they end up uh, building a hut in a town and just farming. Mm-hmm. And um, Otsu eventually shows up there. Um, yeah. Everybody knows where he is. He's not hiding. Um, and she starts to work the land with him. She just keeps getting sicker and sicker of some, mm-hmm. I think, just travel and heartbreak. Yeah. Um, and you ever watch these movies and you're just sitting there going, "Boy, I'm glad I live in the age of modern medicine." <laughs> <laughs> you're like you know you get a good growth on your neck it's like well it's it's just slap some mud on it you know? <laughs> right or you know you 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 get a, a you get a minor paper cut and that's death yeah you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the, you 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 cough twice and you're it's over um you get bell's palsy and it doesn't have a name and it's just like well oh well you must be cursed you're deformed <laughs> get out of town <laughs> You must be cursed. Right. You, know? um, you have to be killed at sunset. So, <laughs> the the third story that winds up getting roped in from, from the first one all the way through the third one is uh, poor Akami. Oh, God. We have to talk about Akami. Oh, um, poor Akami. So, She's so, what, at the beginning, uh, does the term wet behind the ears uh, well, could mean anything to you? So, <laughs> at the, in the first one, she and her mother uh, 
make a living by stripping dead, uh, killed uh, samurai, samurai that, yeah. that they find in the in the woods. They don't kill them, as far as we know. They find the bodies and they strip the they, stuff. They, they strip they the stuff and then they sell it. Yeah. And um, Takazo and Matahachi come up on them and they end up uh, nursing Matahachi back to health over mm-hmm. a few months and they they wind up staying there um their prospect at becoming uh famous warriors dashed because their side lost horribly <laughs> in the battle that they <laughs> fought and akami is kind of trying to get to moose uh matahachi until she finds out that he's engaged to Otsu. And then she's like, well, forget you. I like uh, Takazo. Yeah. And that obsession ruins her life. Yeah. Um, then the mother tries to, well, sexually assaults Takazo. <laughs> um, he's like, no, and leaves. And then she says that he tried to rape her. Right. Um, eventually then the mother marries Matahachi, much to his ruin. He becomes a drunkard, no account shell of a man. Akami winds up, by the end of it, a prostitute. Okay, you remember earlier when I took that long road and I was talking about, um, the codes of honor and different cultures and things like that? I was speaking mostly for men. Now... (laughs) When it comes to women, it's even worse. Oh, much. Oh, much worse. Because much, much. once you're a ruined woman, that's it. I mean, once you're, you know, ruined, spoiled, whatever, that's that's your life. Right. And your only road is probably prostitution. Mm-hmm. If you don't kill yourself first. Right. So the choices for women, it particularly at this time in this culture, were limited and to say the least and it's even worse because if 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 we are to believe the movies 80 percent of all men were rapists back then mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i'm talking a full 80 percent yeah like out of every japanese samurai movie i have seen mm-hmm. There's usually the only one or two or three characters in it that don't attempt or complete a rape of a woman. <laughs> right. Um, everybody, all the men are just looked upon as just horny, horrifying people. Angry. Angry. Horny. Horny. Yeah. People. And who will just jump on a girl regardless and just go to town Right. trade her off and you know women were particularly if the women like the beginning of this film particularly if the women are alone mm-hmm. because the uh yeah the, it's 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 so it's just it's a horrifying so horrifying uh, they the japanese filmmakers were not kind to their ancestors um your trajectory your trajectory of your young daughter is you <laughs> You need to marry her off to a rich man. You know, I mean, your 16-year-old daughter, you know, it doesn't matter. The landowner that you're trying to marry her off to can be a 78-year-old incontinent man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, at least she's marrying rich. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But when he dies, she comes into none of it. Right. Unless she's born a son. When, because women were yeah. basically property, right? Um, well, not basically. Women, women were they were property, were property, considered property. Uh, I just I just recently watched Ridley Scott's The Last Duel, mm-hmm. which was very. I've seen it yet. It's very very good. It's difficult to watch because there's a lot of rape scenes, mm-hmm. but it's basically medieval Rashomon, set around the same time as the samurai trilogy <laughs> and in that there's a there's a court case the the woman maintains that she was she was raped and uh the magistrate is like 
Well, you know, raping her, you know, there's no crime there, unfortunately. There's nothing I can do about that. But he did damage uh, this guy's property by raping the wife, so uh, yeah. it was an injustice to the guy. I'm like, oh. really, oh. really? <laughs> it's like that's not. Really? Oh well, that's not. It's not a crime to 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 rape her. It's it's a crime because she was married, and you, you know now now she won't fuck her husband. Now there's a problem. What? But. Yeah, yeah. She you know, she gets raped mm -hmm. um by Kojiro. Mm -hmm. Um and that's what leads her down to uh prostitution. Right. Um she's wearing a red robe. Cuz her her mother was basically going to sell her to a to a lord anyway. I do like the symbolism um cuz when you first meet her she's she's dressed in white. Mm -hmm. Because she's virginal. When she is, quote unquote, spoiled. By the last one, she's just in red. Yeah, she's in red. Mm -hmm. She's wearing red. She's a lady in red. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the the downward spiral of this poor woman is sad. Oh, it's to say the least. It's crushing, and she she harbors this this love for uh, Takazo Musashi. Um, discovers in the second one that. Takazo is renamed Musashi Miyamoto and goes looking for him ultimately it is her ruin um, her story is just so sad all she wants is just the love of this one person Yeah, this one person isn't in love with her though Right. so it's un unrequited but, and if he followed the, the traditions, he couldn't requite it even if he wanted to. Right. Right. Not with his social standing at the point that he was at the, by the end of, you know, the third one. Yeah. Uh, even where he was by the end of the second one. Mm -hmm. um, and even, even he tries to sexually assaults Otsu right but stops and is horrified by his behavior and mm -hmm. runs off and assumes she never wants to see him again which you know mm -hmm. what valid assumption yeah um, <laughs> we made it the second we made at the beginning of the second one uh, and she's relegated herself to standing on a bridge and selling fans right just waiting for him to come back waiting I mean, and and Akami is trying to wait for him too. Mm. I love the exchange between Otsu and Akami at the bridge because they both say that they're waiting for someone and they both hope, you know, wish the other one well in finding who they're looking for. They're both looking for the same person. Right. And they don't know right. that until later on. Mm -hmm. Um. The Akami Otsu confrontation in the third one is heartbreaking. To me, the Akami Otsu story, that's the more interesting part yeah. for me. Because the samurai story, i you kind of already know this story from when it's been told again, when it's been told after this. The well, Akami <laughs> Otsu story. How many, how many stories about women do you get in these films? Very, um, very few. Unless it's... Unless it's Kenji Mizuguchi, not many. Not many. Mizuguchi did a lot of, uh, I would say, proto-feminist uh, films. Uh, right. Focusing really on geisha and trying to uh, destigmatize it, and you know, it's not their fault, kind of a thing. Mm. Um, but outside of him, yeah, no, you don't really get strong stories for women in Japanese movies, especially not of the time, especially not if they're trying to make it accurate to the period. Here's the funny thing. As dumped on as women have been in um, 
popular culture, even our popular culture, as strong women have been, um, they've been trying to break out of the role of being, if you'll excuse the term, tits and ass. Mm. Um, because you look at the 80s, you had an action movie, that's essentially what women were. Mm -hmm. That's essentially how they were presented. Um, but... Or, or when, as little Susie Homemaker. Yeah, yeah. Barefoot, pregnant in the kitchen. And usually screwed over by the guy. Yeah. And But the thing is, when you had tough, strong women, they just wanted, them, wanted to turn them into men. basically revamped men. Yeah, yeah. Never letting them be strong women on their own. You know, I'm, I'm going to say the title of a movie that you probably haven't heard in a long time, but it is the absolute epitome of that. V.I. Mm -hmm. Wachowski. Or G.I. Jane. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yep. You want you don't want the women to be strong in their own terms. Oh, sure. Pick the one that people are going to remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't go with the obscure Kathleen Turner nonsense. <laughs> Saw that bullshit in a the theater. <laughs> so bad. Um, and <laughs> the women cannot be. The women have to be kick fighters. They have to be um, toting machine guns. They have to be Ellen Ripley. Mm -hmm. um, which there's nothing wrong with Ripley. No. I like Ripley, but um, the model that follows. Is to turn them into right. junior the, league the, men. The, they wanted Ripley's. They didn't yeah. understand how Ripley became Ripley. It's and if not... you look at that second film, there's a motherhood angle there. Yeah. There's a there's a motherhood theme mm -hmm. there that goes along with the, how strong she is. Mm -hmm. And um, in the third one, there's even a the, a spark of a love interest. Spark. Tiny well, it's very, I mean, yeah, but but it's there. It is. I mean, it's a David Fincher movie. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, talk about sexual but, assaults. That's yeah, no kidding. Um, but here the women these, are not. They're they're not, and but they're I, treated as they would be in this culture. Right. In in Agaki. Really. Portrays some deep sympathy towards both Otsu and Akami. Um, yeah. There is no... You know how there's some movies that we're watching and I'll just go, you know, I I kind of figured, I figured out really quickly how the director feels about women. Yeah. Inagaki is not reducing these characters to just oh no yeah come home he's giving these characters breath meat mm -hmm. he's he, the, the, he's letting these women actually create real characters even though the road that they go down is not a positive right right but it's but, still given the time and the circumstances that they're in right and the and the fact that they are integral to musashi's story whereas many of the times in these kinds of samurai movies that that aren't like you know seven samurai or something um mm -hmm. This is the, finally one that shows women as not just side pieces, like literally, like just pieces of furniture in the back, just to be a little up, to be upset when the when the man leaves or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's some real development on these characters and some real real compassion shown for them. He knows how to direct women. He does. Some directors do know how to direct women. James Cameron knows how to direct women. A lot of directors don't. George Cukor definitely knew how to direct women. He directed, knew how to direct women. Um, and for all his faults and foibles, Woody Allen can direct women. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, but it's just interesting... Um, 
peering into this culture, I actually am. I'm actually wanting to look for films that are more positive toward women. Um, I will happily oblige you uh, <laughs> at some point because there are there there are some good ones. Uh, Kurosawa, but Mizuguchi was a was a very uh, pro woman filmmaker. Mm-hmm. In, in Japan in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and given the right... And another director, I think given the right material, can direct women as Spielberg. Because The Color Purple is brilliant. Sure. And and he... Goldie Hawn gives a very good performance in the Sugarland Express. It's not a great movie. It's not a very good movie. <laughs> it's not a bad movie. Um, yeah. But... You know, I, I I love that the the main story in these films is not the sword fights. Right. They are the sword there. Sword fights is kind of a part of it. Right. They're they're there, but they're not. They're not what you're there for, ultimately. Right. Um. At, at the end of the third one, when he gets to Gunrayu Island, uh, he is whittled an oar into a practice sword. Yeah. Because he likes the weight and he likes the size. Because, um... was it? Kaijiro has this huge long sword. Mm-hmm. So he's like, well, I want... He wanted something with extra reach. Right. Um, so he goes into a duel with the only other person in the country that he knows of that could be a challenge to him with a wooden, with just a stick. Right. And wins. Kills mm-hmm. the kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, did you see in the, in, the, in the first one, when he's running around, all he has is that kendo, uh, kempo sword, and he's killing people left and right. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even have a sword. Um, uh, Kaijiro does that too. Do you know how bloodless this film is? It was the 50s. We came off of Lone, Lone Wolf and Cub, which was extremely bloody. That was the 70s, yeah. 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 Uh, this, one is, this one is not. It's, this one is it's not, not like not, that. It's not. It's not. Be- the... the the gun, the the fights at the end are not the focus of the movie. Mm-hmm. They're just the end of the movie, right? Um, and uh, that's that's really all I have for it. Except I want to say this: Hiroshi Inagaki has remade the Musashi story like six times. Mm-hmm. First in 1940, he did two Musashi films. And then again, in 42, he did two more of the same mm-hmm. story, Ichijoji Keto and Doku Gonrayo Masamune, which I think somehow is island. And then he did these in the 50s. But in the... At some point... that Oh yeah, in 1950 and 51... He did a trilogy of Kaijiro. Yeah. Uh, Sasaki Kaijiro in 50, Zoku Sasaki Kaijiro in 51. Zoku just means like two. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Kentaketsu Sasaki Kijoru Gunrayu Jimaketo. So it, that's the duel at Gunrayu Island three years before he does Samurai 1. So. Yeah. The man had been telling this story over and over <laughs> for yeah. a decade and a half before he got here. <laughs> it also needs to be mentioned, this movie won an Oscar. It did, an honorary Oscar for foreign language film. Right, before it was really a category. Um, I like these. These were They're really good. Um, good. The, the thing is, you can see the American influence. Oh, yeah. Star Wars is all over this. You know, um, the funny thing is, when America makes a samurai film, it is best to not to stick it in the in in the culture or in the genre. Yeah. 
but you want to make it as a science fiction film or you want to make it something else. Otherwise, you end up with The Last Samurai. <laughs> Because we can't, we can't handle. We can We are, well, we are dumb Americans. We can't handle a Japanese actor in the lead. We have to put an American star now in the middle of the movie. The Last Samurai <laughs> isn't a horrible movie. It's just a very, 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 very American well, it's, Hollywood. It's, it's a white savior movie. It is a white savior movie. It's um, glory in Japan. Basically, yes, yes. That's yeah. exactly it. That's. <laughs> Because we can't handle a Japanese, just like in Glory, we can't handle a black act, the black actors telling their story. We have to have white Matthew Bright, right. that Ferris Bueller, mm -hmm. in the lead, because we can't handle Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington telling their own story. You know? And we, can't and we needed Emma Stone to tell us the story of the Help, because the Viola help. Davis and uh, and uh, 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 Octavia Spencer, Octavia Spencer were it. apparently not able to do that. By the way, I've got to recommend this. There is a wonderful sketch with David Allen Greer where he gives you lessons in telling one black actor from another because apparently white actors can't. <laughs> I love Here's David the mantra. Allen Greer. Learn our fucking names. Yeah. <laughs> I love David Allen Greer. <laughs> It's like Fifty Cent. It's like Fifty Cent and Kanye West. Can you tell the difference? Oh, I checked, checked, checked you. He switches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that about wraps it up here uh, for me. Uh, and, to, and, to, and, and, and and on that note, yeah. Uh, what do we have coming up? Um, uh, next time we're moving into Black History Month. Um, I believe it's my choice. I believe I'm starting off. Um, mm, I don't know. I think I... our things are out of, out of whack. I think mine was supposed to be first. Was it supposed to be first? Yeah. Which okay. is going to be Love and Basketball. Love and Basketball. Okay. Oh, okay. So. So good. Um, that's the only one. I, I that My other ones are tentative at this point. Um, my other one. Uh, <laughs> my first one is uh, a really funny movie from 1987. And I think probably even more relevant today it is robert townsend's hollywood shuffle um which that that title has a, has a double meaning because it is basically his um satirization of his treatment of being an actor in hollywood mm -hmm. and how hollywood wanted a certain type um always wanting the black guy right 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 you know with that socialectic dialect and the um the negative you know, mm -hmm. kind of st kind of stereotypes there is a scene in this movie that is, is one of the funniest things i've ever seen where there's an audition call for <laughs> an eddie murphy type oh so everybody shows up dressed and looking like eddie in, the, murphy in the red including... leather from delirium <laughs> Yes, and the gray suit from uh, from Raw. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And even white guys with shoe polish on their face, oh. and it is the funniest mm. thing you've ever seen. I uh, I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, You're gonna love I, it. I hope to. Yeah. Uh, my second is to call attention to a film that was recently placed in the National Registry. It is from 1973, I believe. It is, it is Cooley High. Mm-hmm. Wonderful film, wonderful film. I don't think I've seen that one either, so I'm I'm looking forward. I think you're 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 in for a couple of really good ones. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward. Cooley High is the better film, but well, yeah. Robert Townsend isn't exactly a, a magnificent filmmaker as much as he is just a really f fun person. <laughs> it's one of those movies that it's not great, but when it's on, it's on. It, right, I mean, right. When it's, yeah, it's like it's like um, defending your life. When yeah. when it when it works it works when it doesn't it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a great interview with him about that film. Where he talks about in the early '80s just trying to get a job and getting a Budweiser commercial. And 
they were trying not to tell him what we want is we want Robin Williams homeboy act. <laughs> That's what we want you to give us. And he's like, for fuck's sake, it's a Budweiser commercial. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's like, you know, I, I can't come in and be, you know, respectful. I have to come in, you know, say, hey, baby, give me a Budweiser, you know, and all that stuff. And he's like, you know, why do I have to talk like yeah. that? Yeah. That is the crux of this whole movie. And it's it's great. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that's that's what we have coming up in February. Um, I'm pretty sure we have March, but I'm not 100% sure. I do. Um, I think I have one. <laughs> I don't know what it is, though. So, uh, off the top of I'm my head. I'm fixed in for the next three months. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> um, so I think that about wraps it up here for us. Uh, you can find all of our back episodes at the Pod Bay Doors podcast at wordpress.com. You can listen to us on iTunes and uh, YouTube. Hit the like, subscribe, and notifications buttons there. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at pod underscore bay copy and paste that over into patreon and uh that's where you'll find us there we thank you so very much for listening and the pod bay doors are now closed the mission has been completed